Science fiction is a speculative exercise. By speculating on possible futures, sci-fi expands the space of possibilities. Crypto is an extreme kind of sci-fi because as well as offering a vision of the future, it also provides the tools to make that future possible. Crypto is currently energized by a sci-fi called Solarpunk. Evolved from cyberpunk, Solarpunk is a utopian vision of the future characterized by its optimism. For Solarpunks, the future is bright. Solarpunk casts away the dystopian shadows of cyberpunk and illuminates a world beyond the chaotic horizon. In many of the popular DeFi chains, solarpunk hackers are creating transparent infrastructures for funding public goods. The shared belief is simple. Public access to a decentralized and transparent financial system will lead to a fairer and more just world. Solarpunk is crypto's conscious mind. It is bright, self-confident, and future-oriented. Yet the counterpart to Solarpunk faith is lunar punk skepticism. Lunar punks are the solar shadow self. They are the unconscious of this cycle. While solar punks join DAOs, Lunar punks prepare for war and build privacy-enhanced tooling to protect their communities. Lunar punk first came into being as a subset of solar punk. It has always preferred encryption over the plain text paradigm offered by Ethereum and similar chains. Over time, the tensions created by solar punk tendencies have only multiplied. Lunar Punk has been forced to break away from the Solar Punk legacy and is now asserting its own. In the Lunar Punk imaginary, a conflict between crypto and existing power structures is essentially pre programmed. Regulation forces crypto underground, anonymity proliferates. The Lunar Punk vision is rejected as a bearish nightmare. Its foundational conflict, nation states banning crypto, is dismissed by Solar Punk because it produces fear, the kind of fear that compels people to grab their money and run. The optimism of Solar Punk has become synonymous with bull market cycles, while pessimism is associated with the bear. Lunar Punk offers something beyond this simple oscillation. It is a moment of insight between market cycles, a glitch in the hologram where the source code shines through. Solar Punk fragility. Fragile, something that breaks when shaken. Anti fragile, something that absorbs shocks and becomes stronger. Consider the following. Crypto's core innovation is a diptych. It empowers users while equally diffusing its attack surface. User empowerment is negatively correlated with fragility. The more empowered a user base, the more anti-fragile a network becomes. User empowerment and system anti-fragility are in positive feedback with each other. But this cycle also runs in reverse. In a transparent system, users are exposed. If the external environment turns hostile, this information can be weaponized against them. Faced with persecution, users will opt out, triggering a descent into fragility. The solar punk mindset is essentially optimistic. Transparency in solar punk systems is the spirit of optimism projected outward. By building transparent systems, the solar punk says, I have faith that the law won't turn against me. 
its insistence on optimism prevents it from preparing for the worst case scenario. This is the core of solarpunk fragility. Dark optionality. Anti-fragility hinges on unknowability. The future is dark. It cannot be predicted with meaningful certainty. Optionality has been called the weapon of anti-fragility due to its ability to leverage this darkness to its advantage. Optionality assumes your prophecies are wrong most of the time. Being wrong is cheap, while being right is disproportionately rewarding. Lunarpunk integrates optionality because it thrives in the worst case scenario. If the Lunarpunk thesis is wrong, the super cycle continues. If it's right, crypto enters its next phase armed with the appropriate defenses. Being well defended means going dark, using cryptography to protect the identity and activity of users. A prophecy. Anonymity is first compelled into being as an adaptation to mass surveillance, but its existence also further justifies surveillance efforts. This is a positive feedback loop that implies anonymity and surveillance are fated to escalate. Left running long enough, the loop triggers the next phase in the Lunar Punk's prophecy, what is known as the regulation trap. In this phase, governments use the increase in anonymity as a scapegoat to leverage the full extent of their power against crypto. Yet, by cracking down on crypto, hostile powers simply further its justification. Crypto's utility will be correlated with the extent of the crackdown. It expands disproportionately with each received blow. The Lunar Cycle the sun is both a symbol of nature and of tyranny. Through its insistence on transparency and identity, Solarpunk inherits the dual characteristics of its central symbol. Solarpunk systems are desert landscapes in which users are endangered and exposed. Lunarpunk is more like a forest. A dense cover of encryption protects tribes and offers sanctuary for the persecuted. Wooded groves provide a crucial line of defense. Lunar landscapes are dark. They are also teeming with life. Lunar tech is owned and operated by the people themselves in service of their freedom. The lunar cycle upholds democratic techniques against authoritarian technology freedom against surveillance, and diversity against monoculture. By favoring transparency in its systems, Solarpunk is tragically engineering its fate. Surveillance, the mechanism of authoritarianism, is bound to the Solarpunk destiny. For Solarpunk to succeed, it must integrate the Lunarpunk unconscious, the only hope for Solarpunk is to go dark. Good afternoon. I saw this video so many times, and every time I, I see it again, there is something new. I'm not sure what, what do you think about that. Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce you uh, Rachel, who is the, the main brain behind, behind this phenomenon, Yurai, and Amir. Uh, Rachel and Amir are involved in Dark Fire Project, uh, 
we could uh, we could see like a multiple presentation of dark phi. <coughs> and we had a, we had difficult times to uh, find solar punker to this discussion, by the way. Uh, and so so if you f if so 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 <laughs> now 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 this panel discussion will be dark. <laughs> if there is someone who f who feels that he's the the right person, the right solar punk, just raise your hand and come here, please. <laughs> you will you you can join us. Uh, you can join us, and and I think because otherwise this discussion will be very subjective. Okay, but the whole HCP Congress is subjective, so we can survive it. Okay, <clears throat> so I prepare like a set of questions for this panel discussion. Uh, we saw like a few minutes video and Rachel, I have a question. Can you explain us um, just in a few sentences, not the whole video, what's the phenomenon of solar punk and lunar punk exactly means? Okay, it's just a quick definition, like it can't be a history or... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, because I think it's important to understand the solar punk, lunar punk uh, kind of dialectic is also to know about uh, cyberpunk and cypherpunk, um, which came before them, because um, you know it's 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 the it's science fiction, basically a form of science fiction, um, which in the 1960s, um, with the cyberpunk phenomena, there is uh, the book by William Gibson, Neuromancer, and there is like some other. Uh, key texts, but they basically uh, pre-configured uh, the the vi the image, the kind of technology and the kind of society uh, was pre that that ended up playing out in the 80s and 90s was pre-configured in these cyberpunk texts. So like they actually kind of summoned that future into being uh, through their sci science fiction. Um, but it was a it was a world where it was the kind of uh, the, the the lone warrior um, or like lone wolf against like the dystopic uh, corporation um, and you know it was very pessimistic it was like the hacker against the the machine um, and cypherpunk then you know emerges a bit uh, later I think it was the term was first coined in the 90s by a woman um, but you guys can probably correct me on that um, but you know. Uh, we uh, we're all familiar with this. Uh, it it's more I find it more affirmative uh, science fiction than uh, cyberpunk because it's it's is much more about like using tools to reclaim spaces of freedom. Um, so it has a, it's much more empowering narrative. Um, uh, but you know it also has uh, these these tendencies like it's very individual focused. So it's it's very much focused on the liberty of the individual, um, and it's it's broadly pessimistic in some ways. Uh, Solarpunk, I'll try to speed it up. Solarpunk and Lunarpunk then, uh, the um, emerge, Solarpunk emerged in the 2000s. Uh, it does what Cyberpunk uh, did, but it tries to be utopian. Uh, so it's like, let's pre-configure a technical destiny through, uh, you know, um, envisioning these utopias in, in sci-fi. And uh, so that's what Solarpunk was doing. Then it got adopted by uh, Ethereum people. Um, and they used it to kind of, uh, the, the people actually of Ethereum was kind of spontaneously started to promote this, uh, this vision of Solarpunk because they didn't really have an ideological direction. Um, so they started to, bring, to create one with Solarpunk. Um, but it has all these kind of issues that is discussed in the video, and that's where I think we've seen this convergence around the, the lunar punk concept. Of course, a question for you. <laughs> <Okay>. <clears throat> I have a question to all of you. Uh, let me afford a quite strong simplification. Um, can we just say that solar punkers are just statist? Uh, believing in the government and lunar punk lunar punkers are just anarchists who don't believe in the government. Testing. Oh? 
uh, I was watching the Claros uh, video from EFCC, and Claros is the decentralized uh, justice system that they're creating on Ethereum. So you have Claros courts and you have Claros judges. And in, if you look at the EFCC video on YouTube, the guy says that Foucault talked about the panopticon, but actually Foucault got it wrong because the panopticon was meant to be a decentralized system of surveillance, and therefore it was a good thing. Uh, and then uh, I posted about that on the internet, and the team even uh, came up to me, and they were, going, they were trying to convince me that the panopticon's a good thing. <laughs> and uh, they were going, Amir, no, you don't understand. And I was like, dude, I come from England where it was invented in the Victorian times. You know, like, it's the same movement of, like, factory school system and uh, garden cities and all that, like, engineering of, and central management of society come from that English philosophy in the Victorian times. It's like, I know my country's history and the panopticon is not like, <laughs> it's not a good thing, you know? <laughs> and that's, that's like Solarpunk. Uh, if, you look at, if you just look at the images, Solarpunk on Google Images, uh, it literally just, it, yeah, I don't know, how would you describe it? Solarpunk imagery. Uh, okay, um, well, it's often, Basically, um, it looks very much like the world that we have now, except for there's more greenery. So you have these like financial, huge, shiny al aluminium financial structures with like uh, moss on them. Uh, and it reminds me, like, or solar punk in general reminds me of um, it. A bit later, I can I can argue I can from the perspective of the solar punks, but for now I'll just I just uh, you know. Um, say that um, my friend has a really good analogy uh, what to talk about green capitalism where he says that uh, he, he, right before um, the uh, Hitler's um, the right before the Third Reich was uh, captured but the end of Nazi Germany um, the there was a plot to assassinate Hitler um, because Hitler is like very uh, very like singular with his ideology. He was like, either we win or we deserve to all die. So he was like, we're gonna fight this uh, to the end kind of thing. So there was, a, there was a plot to assassinate him and basically preserve the Third Reich with all of its territory and, uh, and all, of its, um, all of its luxuries, but uh, just to remove this Hitler element, which was, you know, making it so crazy. And uh, nowadays, th those people, they failed in their attempt, but those people are, are, are seen as heroes in Germany. Um, and my friend says that uh, this is, is uh, it analogous to green capitalism, because it's like, let's preserve the basic structure as it is, but just remove the most ugly elements. And that's kind of like, in a way, worse. You know, you're just obscuring the, the most ugly elements. And I think that's what, the, for me, solar punk images convey, you know, this kind of like it's the same world, bit more moss. So it kind of implies that there's been, <laughs> they're using, uh, you know, tr um, plants to create more uh, oxygen or something. They've like solved capitalism, th the, the, the effects of capitalism, but the basic industrial society is the same. I think uh, a typical image, uh, or actually an object that would represent solar punk, uh, is the artificial trees in Marina Bay Sands in Singapore. This, the, these are covered by plants, they produce oxygen from the waste, and it's like completely green, it's beautiful, looks uh, like very biological. So if, if you go there, it's exactly this. It's a centrally planned system with probably every plant there having an entry in a database and <laughs> like when it was last watered or something. So it's like very, uh, 
but it's beautiful, of course. The solar punk images are very nice, but they're kind of um, made of the central engineering. So the idea is that the uh, smart people, experts, scientists, they decide what is good, how to achieve it using technology, and uh, then they build it, uh, but uh, it's usually fragile. Uh, good when it when it is not but if you don't have many experiments and you just do a do a design that has not been tried in the market or anywhere else uh, then that that's one of the reasons why it can uh, go wrong but i would say uh, to your original question if it's like uh, same as comparing statists to anarchists i don't think so i think many uh, solar punkers actually want to do things like finance uh, public goods on the blockchain so they're actually building a parallel to the to the state uh, their only flaw uh, is except that it's usually a little bit more uh, uh, top-down than we would like to see or more hierarchical um, their only problem is that they're competing with the people that are uh, that have the monopoly on supplying public goods. <laughs> so the politicians they don't like that, you know. Uh, uh, I, the politician, uh, am here to build those trees, <laughs> and it was built by the Singaporean government, I think, in this case. Um, so when these people compete with things like uh, anonymous exchanges, uh, tornado cash and stuff like that, they get crushed because uh, uh, they don't like competition, you know, for votes. It is uh, good if you can show the road that you built and the beautiful building and the new hospital and, and all these things. Uh, so actually, I think uh, uh, solar punks believe that they could cooperate with the mainstream society because if your idea is uh, I know what I'm doing, I'm building uh, this beautiful new thing with experts and scientists, uh, then you don't believe that um, actually there are people that would say no, it's crap, you can't do it, you know, because you believe that you're bu building something good and beautiful. So why would a politician come and crush me? But uh, the reason <laughs> why a politician comes and crushes uh, you is because uh, he wanted to do it. He couldn't do it because it's, you know politicians, they usually don't create beautiful things. Uh, but they see it as a competition. So I think uh, in this case, uh, solar punks maybe believe otherwise, but they're uh, not very close to statists, actually. My opinion. <clears throat> so do you think it's only a question of time when solar punks just realize that, you know, that there are so many attacks on us, for example, Tornado, case, like Ethereum developers, for example, that it's high time to do something with that, for example, to become like a lunar punk. So my question is, if it is like, a, if they are able to reflect what's going on, and if if it is only a question of, of time when they are able to switch their opinions. Uh, I will quickly answer. Uh, both will happen. Some of them will. Uh, some projects will get crushed and banned and stopped and go bankrupt and some people uh, will do it. So as the cycle repeats, you know, it cleans the, the fragile uh, projects uh, and then those people who have done them uh, that have not end up in jail, uh, they need a new job. So <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think both will happen. And this is my, my, my second question because this is not just my subjective feeling, but it seems that in, uh, in these days, uh, the governments, I would not say our governments, but the, their governments, uh, have the lowest trust from their citizens, just because of pandemic, inflation, energetic crises, the war. So, so uh, because of this lo the lowest trust in the government, can we expect the rise of global lunar park movement soon because of it?
So, uh, testing, okay. Uh, we, 20 years ago, as uh, hackers, we were going, oh dude, there's like open source software on the internet to do facial recognition. And London's got the highest rate of CCTV cameras in the world, or in the Western world. Um, you know, if I, I can literally code that in 15 minutes, you can bet the government is doing that with all the footage that they have. And people are like, dude, that's crazy. That's a conspiracy theory. And it's like, today, you know, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's like fact. It's like pretty well known. And not only that, the... Um, there are literally um, really dodgy shit going on. Like Jay Stark was killed by the German government. In England, we had uh, the lead nuclear investigator under Tony Blair. You know, a few months later when he, he was the guy that was in charge, he revealed that it was all fake. It was an excuse for the war. He turned up two days later in the forest with his wrist slit. Uh, bled to death and um, you know uh, satanic imagery uh, in in the media like very explicit um, you know celebrities and politicians performing like rituals and uh, all the links with like pedophile rings which is too it's like you know uh, once you're like okay you know twice but when there's like so many coincidences you know that and just the, just the way that the CIA and the deep state operate in general uh, the you know people go oh you know anonymous software isn't that gonna allow a criminal to operate and it's like dude like we're way beyond that, and uh, you know now um, the nature of drones has changed warfare so much that before, you know, you had the ability, you know, last line of defense, you know, you had the ability to kind of, you had that option there, and it, and it's not it's not that, you know, me. Um, him having a gun and me having a gun means that I'm going to shoot him, but it does mean that the interaction is is has power behind it. That you know that um, I can't exploit him because you know that's that's just the nature of how human societies operate. You know when we talk about democratization of society and putting power in the hands of people rather than uh, states and centralized parties. But uh, the drones, they basically um, can fill the entire sky with a surveillance system. They, they literally fly for hours in circles, nonstop, watching one area of the ground. And not only that, they're developing now robots, automated robots. Uh, and all of this is automated weaponry with minimal human interaction. So... Uh, like, why are we building that shit? Like, that is, that's very, very uh, nightmare stuff. And uh, so, uh, I don't, so anonymity is, um, like, you know, if you look up hard power on Wikipedia, it will say hard power is military and uh, economic power. Those are like the two forms of hard power. Or, or kind of coercion. Uh, but I'd argue there's a new third emerging category, which is cryptography. It means we can use cryptography as a, as a, as a, as a tool or system of techniques to protect ourselves, to protect the society, to protect um, our community. Um, and that's what the video meant about the dark forest as a as an area that provides cover and foliage. The, um, and, and right now, because of 
uh, cryptocurrency and tokenization, we are seeing a renaissance in cryptography where the new techniques that have been invented open up entirely new design space that nobody ever before has ex ex been has explored. In, in the 80s, the developers of Unix, and if anybody searches AT&T Unix on YouTube, there's a really good documentary shows Dennis Ritchie, Ken Thompson, all the original guys des designing Unix, explaining why they're building it. But they were the old, uh, they, they pioneered the computer. They changed something very fundamental about computing technology. Uh, uh, but at the time, you know, they were limited by the resources that were available to them, the computing resources and the techniques of computer science, etc. But the, this, the vision of computing that they were trying to create that revolutionized computing was one of computing, one where you could join computers together, you could network computers, you would have many processes, multiple people could work together to achieve great things, could, could do things. And this is the difference with the Linux paradigm versus the proprietary paradigm. With proprietary software, like if you look at all the apps on the app that you download from the internet to do stuff, they're all terrible, they're dog shit. They're, they're, they're nasty and they're crap and because they're, they're built for normies, for low IQ uh, plebs, basically, because they, they just want to extract value out of their users. It's a bad business model. And that's why, uh, that's why advertisement, you know, like it's, it's just a really shitty form of value capture where you just have to get your users to do really uh, low forms of economic activity, clicking ads, basically, to make profit. You know, and it ends up with all this data surveillance stuff. But the Linux, pa the Linux paradigm is different because the software that's built in Linux is not built to uh, try and capture mass map, uh, capture the maximum number of normies in your net so you can uh, exploit them. In the Linux paradigm, uh, the software is built uh, is so that people can build infrastructure, so people can uh, 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 work together to like to build systems. And, and that's where we as a community get, get, get strong, get powerful, is by joining our, 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 using our technology to be able to more effectively work together, to operate together. And the whole point is, is that every revolution that happened throughout history, uh, it, the basis of that revolution was a, a kind of parallel society. You know, in ancient, in ancient Greece, it was the academy. You know, in... Um, in you know, the Renaissance, it was like study groups and all, all throughout history, it was some kind of parallel society that, that, that nurtured the, 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 society, the spirit of the society, which, is, which we call the democratic nation, which is the democratic nation has always existed. It's actually what create all the value in society. It's like that is, that is the, the economy of the people, the market, the free market. The, the system, the, the, the system um, of, of state civilization, that is, that is anti-market, that is anti-free free markets. And, um, the, and uh, the, par the parallel society, it encodes inside of its DNA that it's the, in, in such a way that it's, it contains those seeds and it's um, immune to authoritarianism. And, through our technology now, this is like the system that we have to construct. And the, the people who created Unix in the 80s, they revolutionized the computer paradigm. They, they changed the idea of computing. But where they wanted to go to, they couldn't, they couldn't achieve the full vision that they wanted to accomplish, which was because they were limited by the resources of the computer and the techniques, etc. But the, the cryptography opens up like an entirely new space for a, a massive, massive revolution in technology itself, in the paradigm of computing as we use it. For example, like zero knowledge proofs or MPC or many different stuff. Um, yeah, I was just gonna, just quick note, which was like, um, there's, there's, there's a really good book by S S Shoshana Zuboff called uh, Surveillance Capitalism. And um, in that book, she the first half is like um, more journalistic. She's like analyzing um, what are the um, 
what are the business practices of things like Google and Facebook and so on, and then you know looking at various um, uh, uh, various cases, and then the second half of the book, various cases of like da data uh, stealing and that kind of stuff. Second half of the book, she talks about the ideological structure of Google and and the and the whole big big tech paradigm where it's like how did they start to think that uh, surveilling everyone and monitoring everything was good. And she she finds the roots in this like particular MIT professor who's who's really into um, uh, Skinner I think his name was the and the, there was this this uh, kind of dystopic it was perceived as dystopic but it was written as a utopia there was a sci-fi called Walden Two which was um, this like uh, it's supposed to be a utopia but it was like a utopian society where um, basically there's no free will. Uh, and society is like um, perfectly managed by by tracking everyone and monitoring everyone and like uh, basically treating uh, society as like a system, um, uh, like a closed system that you can operate and manage. And it was a utopia, but it was it was it was it was perceived when it was released as like uh, as like a nightmare scenario by everyone who was like, well, why would you want to get rid of free will and why would you want to monitor everyone? That sounds creepy and. So it was mostly rejected. People were like, "What utopian?" No, um, but then these uh, MIT guys that you know Zuboff talks about, they 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 got really into that sci-fi, and that's what encodes the ideal or like the, that's the vision of of Google and that kind of stuff, as well as just like the raw power of of data collection. Um, that's a big component as well. Um, but I I see elements of this same ideology maybe in a in a in a more um, empower, empowered way but I do see elements of that Walden two vision in some of the solar punk stuff which um, you know it's like oh we can engineer people with incentives you know we we can we know all the data so we can engineer it as a system well um, and it's just, it's like highly positivistic thinking very like systems thinking but it's uh, talking about societies and it's slightly creepy. But you know, at the same time, we can also talk about uh, what are the good things about Solarpunk because I do think it has some merits relative to other crypto ideologies or uh, sci-fi's. Uh, thanks. Maybe I would like to repeat my last question and ask uh, Yurai. So, so the thing is that uh, can we expect the rise of global lunar punk movement soon? I'm going to explain it in more details. Like ten years ago, uh, in the beginning of, of Bitcoin. Uh, we were like a super optimist crypto anarchist, which means that we 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 believe that in ten years, like a uh, crypto uh, will just I'll say, throw away uh, or eliminate uh, power of existing government. And in these days, we can see the opposite. You know, the governments uh, and the states are stronger and stronger, and and it seems like these cryptos still. Uh, doesn't re uh, still doesn't reach or didn't reach uh, some uh, critical mass. So so I still uh, I still think that the governments uh, still still have control over over uh, most people. I mean, uh, I don't think it's a good way uh, to look at. Uh, the power of crypto and power of the state uh, in form of uh, measure. I would uh, look at the fragility more than uh, uh, magnitude uh, because um, it is very hard to estimate these things. You cannot really compare it. It's not the same, same units. So, um, because crypto is used by people who want to use it right now. It's not, you know, uh, sucking everyone. Uh, mostly people who are either intellectually interested or they had a bad experience, they, all, they go in crypto. And I think we can do what we always could do and more. So the regulations are only so when people say that there are crypto regulations, what they mean is uh, that uh, uh, they reg try to regulate what we do with crypto through the fiat networks. So a crypto exchange, a KYC exchange, is not a crypto project. It's a, it's a financial institution embedded in the system. And 
then when you unpack the details, okay, what is the power of crypto, what is the power of the state, uh, what is growing, uh, you look at things like GDP and market cap, which are both shitty measures of anything. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty in number of users, in the size, in the impact, uh, who is using it, because if you have anonymous cryptocurrencies, it all goes dark. You don't know if, uh, you know, Argentinian family offices of the top 100 uh, um, richest families in Argentina are buying Monero. You would never never know that. So there are not good measures, but uh, measuring fragility is, um, uh, I think, much easier uh, because you just see how it reacts on impact and if it gets better or worse. And we had a very nice, uh, not so nice, but uh, it happened, very impactful um, thing happened, which was the pandemic. And I think that it maybe made the state bigger, but it definitely made it more fragile. You could see it. It's like it's br everything is breaking apart. So uh, fragility and anti-fragility is very easy to measure. And I think both are happening at the same time. So you cannot do like a linear projection. Okay, crypto has been rising for the past 13 years and it's all good uh, because they are also fragile. Um, and there will be many interactions and you could never predict, uh, uh, you could never predict in a, a particular interaction what would happen. So. It's, it's not so predictable. Um, to your first part of your question, um, no, I don't think uh, it will be a mass movement. Uh, uh, and the measure of how fast it will be uh, is determined by the, uh, by the system, by the operation. You would become lunar punk if your money is seized. You would become lunar punk if you could not leave your country with your money. Um, so when these things start happening to people and they're increasingly happening to more and more people, these people will have to go dark because they have learned from experience. Then maybe they hear about their friends uh, having a weird experience and it could be a thing, uh, but this is not determined about how good this idea it is, how good the projects are. This is determined by how unusable uh, uh, the, the normal, in this case, financial system is or information. So when we have seen in Slovakia uh, censorship of uh, like a hoax pro-Russian media, what happened? They started Telegram channels, they switched from uh, quadratic growth to full exponential gro growth of groups. So everyone met in uh, Telegram groups, usually, uh, unfortunately for them. <laughs> and in these groups, uh, uh, contrary to social media, everyone sees every message. So there is even less filtering than, than it used to be. Uh, so everyone reads everything, they can share it in a group. So uh, when you receive something and send it to another thousand people who will read it, uh, it actually powers. So, so you could see, okay, in this completely unrelated field to us of uh, hoax media, uh, the result of the censorship was that Telegram was the most downloaded app in Slovakia because people wanted to read this stuff and now they, have, they are even more exposed to it. So I, I think this dynamic, but it's determined by the level of surveillance, censorship, regulation. So from, <clears throat> from this point of view, maybe you can say that, for example, in Russia or Ukraine, there are, like, there are more incentive of people to become like a lunar punk because, the, because oppression, especially in Russia, is like really, really strong. Can I, ask you, can I ask you guys a question as well? Which is, uh, what happened to the, why, why nobody made the decentralized Silk Road yet? Where is it? And like, why is everybody using Discord? Like, I don't know, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> there are like, okay, there are many, 
decentralized markets, but the net for the, 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 the net for like a particle, for example, it was like an open bazaar before. Uh, now it's particle, but nobody knows about these projects, and so like a need for need need for I, net, net, net I for think effect uh, is too slow. <laughs> I think that the uh, drugs supply chain works too good, <laughs> so so they don't need it, <laughs> yeah. maybe. And why is everyone using Discord? Uh, uh, that's horrible. And uh, there was a there, there's a, a group, uh, a libertarian group uh, in Slovakia uh, that uses Discord, and their server was like cancelled three times because someone. <laughs> posted a Hitler meme or something <laughs> <laughs> and they still like I told them uh, to go at least to Matrix or anything mm -hmm. and 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 uh, yes uh, it's less horrible than than Discord um, but uh, but uh, yeah but it doesn't play videos and <laughs> and memes and Hitler memes so uh, anyway uh, so yeah uh, Again, uh, the same thing, you you know, they will uh, delete all your communication three times because you posted something wrong and then people will move, you know. They, uh, they will, or they would just talk like a normie on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> I have another question prepared for you guys. So, uh, unfortunately, we don't have any, or fortunately, hard to say, we don't have no solar punks here. Uh, so my so my question is, what would you, what would, what would you like to say to all solar punks? I mean, uh, send, send them the, send, send them the message, send them the message. Give me a hug. No, okay. so, um, <laughs> so there is a, there is a, there was a really good article by um, a guy, a uh, philosopher called Paul Dylan Ennis, who writes sometimes articles for Coindesk. And uh, he has an article on Solarpunk and Lunarpunk, which is good. Uh, and I direct you all to that. But I, I wanted to respond to the, basically he presents like the Solarpunk um, position. So he says that like his critique of Lunarpunk is that, um, uh, Lunar Punk is, is failing to really offer a positive vision uh, that it's like, um, that it's, uh, it's, it's a Hobbesian war of all against all and that uh, people don't want to live in that world. They don't want to live in a, like a war world. They want to uh, they, they wanna live in like a, a world with fields and sunshine and the solar punk things, you know. So um, that, that's like the too long didn't read. But to be honest, I, I didn't read fully the solar punk part of the article because <laughs> I just skimmed and went to the lunar punk part. But anyway, so maybe, uh, so if Paul, if you're uh, watching or if this, I don't know, is recorded, um, it's like I, I may be misconstruing his argument. What read, the article is good. But uh, in terms of the lunar punk, uh, he, he, he offers a good critique. So I think what what's the, the, the lunar punk should do now is now focus on more clearly articulating uh, you know what is the, the the vision that's being proposed like and and you know spending more time also developing its own um, uh, kind of visual language the because the images that are put forward are really important in like pre-configuring that um, uh, that that's that sci-fi imaginary that has the potential to create like new forms of technology uh, in the future um, so so I think that's a that's a good thing and then also uh, uh, emphasizing that, um, lunar punk is actually a very optimistic uh, thing. It's not a pessimistic, it's not a war of all against all. So I think that's a, a mistake. So basically, um, I respond to that, to the to solar punks to say that. Um, but I would also say that if there are truly s solar punks that are um, actually, you know, anti-state, because some of the times, like to your point, they seem to be just covertly uh, seeming to be, even if they're not uh, the state, you know, they're behaving, they're, they're, rev they're revealing uh, state mindset or like, you know, they, they seem to be formed by this, what we are, what I explained in the talk, it was like state-based civilization, you know, they're like, um, they, they're, they're giving the impression of that, um, but they're not, in, they're not in the position of a state. Um, so some of the times, 
you do encounter that, but you also get other kinds of solar punks who are more legit and who are anti-state. Um, and so, you know, t I would speak to those solar punks and uh, I would tell them to abandon uh, transparent blockchains like Ethereum because they're a desert landscape, like literally uh, to like imagine it's like you have uh, a sky like filled with drones and that like, you're on a desert and they can just like, and like, like just very easily just like kill you versus like forest environment where there's, uh, where there's cover. Um, so, so I would just encourage those uh, solar bunks to uh, go dark. And basically, you know, uh, if if they are truly, um, if they are truly ideological and truly revolutionary, that they would uh, become lunar punk. Uh, I always like to explain um, the positive vision of uh, this anti-fragility that is there because anti-fragility means that uh, it will end up well, <laughs> or better than now, if, uh, uh, if every, everything goes as now, because it's non-linear. Um, but I understand that uh, uh, it's quite difficult to uh, explain why anti-fragility is optimistic, because it's a very abstract term, so uh, that's why I like uh, the dark forest, because um, that is something you can imagine. And uh, I think that we are very positive people. I have very positive view uh, of the future. I don't, I don't know about Amir, he will say <laughs> what he thinks, but... Uh, it's so, my next question. So to, um, to solar punks, uh, I don't think we need to tell them anything. We are not their enemy. Uh, it is just that they're fragile and they will be crushed, uh, not by us. And we don't wish them anything bad. Uh, you know, uh, you go dark and uh, you grow. Uh, and they try to do many good things. Uh, but they're fragile because of the desert landscape. So, uh, so yeah, uh, we're fun people to hang around, so solar punks, welcome. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, well, it's, it's not an adversary relationship at all, I think. Um, so before we talked about technological power and the strength of the Linux paradigm and how um, it builds infrastructure that serves society, and every you know, like revolutionary movement, every big change in society is because uh, adoption of technology. Like that's like a very big driver of his change in history. Like new groups with new philosophies adopt new technologies. They find new ways of remaking the world. Um, and there's another aspect though that's, that's really important. There's the other, another really big driver in, in history and that's economic power. And remember at the beginning we said that there are two forms of hard power, military and economic. So economic is a form of hard power. And, you know, um, the interesting thing now is with crypto is that we have the ability to create our own economic networks and to move value around and to, you know, create our own system. So... Uh, econ there's Richard Werner, he's an economist, and one the I, I, I saw some, something that he was talking about, which was the power of economic networks, and um, and he, he talks about how uh, everybody likes to talk about money, uh, but, you know, there is... Uh, the thing that's behind money, which is the economic networks. So, for example, does, does, does someone actually want to tell me what money is? Anyone? Any Austrian? <laughs> yeah, medium of exchange. That's what. That's any other? Pardon? Memory of 
good deeds of society. Oh, memory of good deeds of society. I didn't. I don't know if I can. Uh, well, the ones I usually hear is like, what's that medium of exchange, store of value, value. Unit, of account. unit of account, et cetera, transactional something. Uh, the, the problem with those is they're like properties of money. They're not like actually a definition of what money is. So actually, when we look at money, we go back uh, long before money existed, many thousands of years, um, actually, uh, there were really sophisticated finance and economic networks, really so in ancient Mesopotamia, sophisticated banking networks. People had storehouses where they could put grain and livestock and precious minerals, precious metals, etc. And they would obtain a clay object that represented one unit of that in, in the vault. And people could even make them into contracts. They could do different, and they would like say, oh, I will pay you a, a grain of... Uh, wheat in three months from now. And um, actually, that's where writing came about and mathematics came about is because actually it was from accounting systems and uh, people were trading tokens with each other and they had even sophisticated derivatives. They had futures and options and all the advanced like banking operations, gyro settlement of debt, etc. And uh, archaeologists, they find these tokens everywhere throughout the cradle of human civilization, like literally hundreds of thousands of them. So there was a huge, the markets were very liquid. Um, so the, and, and it was only much later in the Persian empire that we got the bimetallic gold and silver standard. So what this story actually tells us is uh, more uh, primary than money is economic networks. There's a lot of power in economics. So, for example, if I have one dollar in a Swiss account, that's very, that, that's very different to if I have a dollar in a Seychelles bank account. Like the types of people I can send it to, the way that I can use it, for instance, a Seychelles bank account. So the money is not actually fungible. Even people talk about things like inflation rates and so on, but that's, that's like specific to an area. The, the, the inflation rate in El Salvador is different to in, in the US. So it's, you know, like we tried to look at these, these measures, but actually uh, there's something more specific, which is economic networks. And, and I worked like maybe many years on uh, more, than, like, more than a decade on free software. And we were always, uh, you know, struggling for resources. And that's like a classic problem, the creative people who create value, they don't necessarily have a good way to capture some of that value back. But, uh, you know, now, uh, you know, like when America went into Iraq, they destroyed the government. And the first thing they did was set up a central bank. That was like literally the first thing they did. And like China's going into Africa now. And they set up like all these economic networks because China's like it peaked, kind of peaking on its growth. So it has to like go overseas now where there's like cheap land, labor and resources in, in Nigeria and Ethiopia. And so they built these financial networks. And there's, there's like economic networks used to only be the purview or arena of nation states. But now there's a new class that's emerging that's able to operate in that economic space. We're able to establish our own financial networks. And as, as we see, like financial networks are actually the basis of a huge amount of stuff that goes going on in today's world. So we can, we can if we master... Our technology, and this is this is the lunar punk mindset, which is the the we have to actually, you know, like the the solar punk thing is like okay, we can we can like engineer a, a, a perfect system where everything's fair, you know, like where everyone, everybody that's like a really popular subject in solar punk is UBI, and, and like UBI is like type of socialism on the blockchain. It's like oh, I'm gonna get benefits, you know, to live for free, but the problem is that system like requires surveillance. There's like no way to do that without having some kind of identification system. That's why the ETH people is always talking about identification systems. Literally like the orb thing that you scan your eye to get an airdrop. Yeah. And and uh but but uh the other side of crypto is like the from the crypto anarchist side, which is that 
we can use cryptography and we can use that to create spaces of freedom that allow us to operate, allow us to like grow and expand and create this parallel society, which is our, which is the contain the seeds of new anti-authoritarian society. So uh, that's so like cryptography is a very powerful tool in that because uh, that's what the crypto anarchists were talking about, creating dark spaces, like subterranean spaces where you can move undetected. The Egyptian, and this is like all in our mythology as well, the like relationship between like technology and um, the moon god. That's why like, for example, Thoth in ancient Greece, the moon god, it's, it's uh, the god of uh, uh, mathematics and technology and wisdom and writing and accounting. And it's the god also that illuminate the path at nighttime for people who walk, walk in the dark. Western civilization has had like a long and, and glorious daytime, but the sun is setting. And what awaits us is a long night ahead of us. And it will be those people that, that use the power of the moon, the, the light from the moon to traverse the darkness that will emerge at the end of that tunnel into a new day. Thanks. Uh, before I'm going to ask all the audience for a question, I have the last question for you, and it's very general. So, how do you see the future? And please describe two scenarios. Your wishful future and the worst case scenario. Okay, so... Um I, I think you know we we've we've had a very um, uh, a, a clear read on this for uh, a, a good long time. Like that that video um, came out uh, to the public just a few days before the Tornado Cash sanction, but the um, text that made the video was written much before that, and even again before that, we were publishing texts talking about the split between RegFi and DarkFi, which you know, the, our project is, is named after this uh, um, emerging sphere. So we've had a very clear read on this for a while. And the way it seems to be going is um, you know, a cycle of escalation playing out between surveillance and uh, encryption that leads to the emergence of two spheres, one which we call RegFi, regulated finance. Um, it's like lost most of its utility it's just a surveillance device like within the field system um, versus, you know, dark fight, uh, which we've been talking to you a lot about this weekend. Um, it's like the underground, the forest, the parallel uh, society. And also, you know, the kind of external, uh, extra, like extra, est extraterrestrial space uh, elected by the lunar punks beyond the restrictions of, of the, the limitations of state-based thinking and mindset. Um, so the best case scenario for me is uh, that the, this process that we've seen play out, the cycle of escalation, um, leads to the creation of uh, dark zones which are impenetrable by um, uh, state violence and that these like new, this like dark forest essentially that's emerging uh, incubates um, uh, a new form of society or various new forms of society um, out of that ability that, that um, to uh, live your own uh, moral political framework, your, to see out your own destiny without um, influence by the state, essentially. So um, that's, what, that's the best possible outcome. Um, the worst possible outcome is that that process is delayed. Um, I do think that that is the, the process that will play out but uh, it could um, take longer and then, you know, within my lifetime, uh, I, I, I won't see those things, but I will still, um, you know, try to con contribute to that process because I think it, you know, even if it takes, uh, it might take several centuries, sometimes these things do. So, um, that's it. Uh, I like, um, uh, I think I read it in, one of the uh, newsletters from Paul Rosenberg, where he talks about um, uh, the end of Roman Empire. Uh, and he explains that 
uh, it was a long process and some people realized that uh, it's gone and uh, that they no longer live in Rome, they live under some completely different system. And some believed that, you know, there's the emperor on the coin, so and we call each other Romans, so it still exists. Uh, so I think that actually all of these future futures will uh, play a ro role uh, and different parts of society will have different experience. So uh, I think that uh, uh, lunar punk vision is not so much in the future. We can leave it today uh, with maybe uh, more limited technology than in the future. Uh, but we can actually experience it right now and many people uh, from crypto anarchy circles uh, are living it every day now. So it's not a future. Uh, I think it will be part of the future, but for other people uh, the future will be completely different. Maybe they will try uh, one of the uh, solar punk utopias that are uh, shaped by uh, by the establishment uh, and comply. They They may have that experience. Many people will not notice for a long time. They will just think that uh, business as usual. Uh, okay, I need to uh, uh, save more to, to repair my, my machines or you know the money is not working so well, I have to wait longer for a car. Um, so they will see this, um, uh, this economic uh, collapse maybe slowly playing out. Uh, but it's like the, you know, when you uh, slowly uh, cook the frog and you increase the heat. Uh, it may be that for some people they would still believe that those guys in parliament make the rules and uh, there would be other people who would not even know the rules because they uh, detach themselves uh, out of the system. So I, I don't think there is a, uh, uh, that the right approach is to assign why one vision uh, of a future uh, probability and a different one a different probability. I think when you take most of these futures, they will all play out at the same time and it's just the ratio between who has what kind of experience. Yeah. Sorry, I just I wanted to add something to my answer because I realized that I um, kind of uh, like s disagree with myself, um, which is that uh, I, I, I said that the best case scenario is that this process plays out within my lifetime and the worst case scenario is that it takes several centuries, but I think there's far worse scenarios than that. <laughs> um, so, so I don't think uh, that, that, you know, and necessarily the process will unfold in this, in this way exactly either. Um, it, it, it could go either way and it could go the way that um, what wins out is this, uh, this kind of new kind of uh, sur surveillance-based society where, um, uh, you know, we, we become a kind of post-humanity Borg-like creature where we're all like hooked in to the machine and, you know, free, we free will has been transcended and those kind of things like that, 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 that could, um, that could actually win. Uh, so I, I just wanted to, but, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that, uh, that it won't, but I just wanted to point out that it could. Okay, so um, what, what will happen, uh, what is the, the, the kind of uh, best outcome or what we're searching towards, and uh, what is the disaster scenario? So what's at stake? So, first of all, we are shifting from a unipolar uh, liberal world order to a multipolar world order. So that's something that we have to account for. We have to accept that that's happening. So there's, so there's, there's the critique against liberalism and things like solar punk is that the Western order, the global order as we know it, is coming to an end. So any philosophy that 
like solarpunk, which tries to engineer human societies in a certain way, uh, it, it needs hegemony uh, to be successful, and it seeks after hegemony compared to the, the other tendency, the one that we're talking about, which is empowering communities with certain philosophies to extend their activity, to become more powerful. So, you know, uh, in Europe, well, England, I've, it will be a shithole, and I've already written it off. Uh, the EU, it's probably going to be poor and weak. Um, you know, maybe a collection of medieval nationalist states. The US, you know, it's likely it could split into two or more countries. There's a huge, huge uh, cultural division in, in America, and it's, it just it doesn't seem like these two nations that exist in this one nation state that they're reconcilable, they're, I think they're irreconcilable. So maybe we'll see a balkanization of, of US, US power. Uh, so there's a, there's a breakup of the global liberal order, there's the rising of new upstarts, and you know there's potential for, for our, our type of civilization, a decentralized or democratic civilization to take root, and this is what will lead humanity ultimately to a new renaissance which will uh, allow uh, uh, free thought to prosper. So in terms of you know, how, how society should be, well, you know, there's three dimensions that I will take a look at, which is economics. You know, as we said, economics is very important in society. There's technology because we're uh, obviously focused on technology and that's another important historical factor. And there's philosophy or politics. What is our philosophy and by extension, what will our political system look like? So in terms of economics, like our economics should be decentralized with local banks oriented around small businesses, cooperatives, you know, um, those kind of structures. And for an exam historical example of that, we could look at the Raiffeisen system in Germany where they had like the local Sparkeisen banks that would issue credit on a local level. And that's, that's why Germany experienced huge amounts of growth and stability was because its economy was very decentralized. The hands, to the, the, the ability to manage credit was on a local level, not in a central bank. Um, and and uh, so in terms, of, in terms of technology, we talked about the Linux paradigm. Linux, it's like, it's like little Lego blocks that have been assembled together. They're very elegant. You know, you can, you can decide how you want to put these together to create anything. You can create anything with Linux. Like the window manager I use is, is 2,000 lines of code. And I, can, and I edit the code to code my own win, windowing system. I can make it how, how I want. If there's some feature I don't like, I can change it. And it allows, it allows us to build infrastructure like peer-to-peer -peer software and Bitcoin mining nodes and stuff like that. Um, and, the, and it's different to the Silicon Valley technology, which is about capturing normies, extracting value out of the normies, uh, because it doesn't, it's not meant to enslave us. It's meant to empower us. So like it, that's what infrastructure means, rather than I call them craps. You know, like they're just dog shit apps that you install and chuck away, and they're not even efficient to use. Um, okay, philosophy. The center of our philosophy is n nature. Like nature is, we are a big aspect of nature as well. And that's what we talk about when we talk about humanity and human nature. Uh, and society is it's it's moral and and it's political they're both connected together that's what what gives society its power and the state doesn't doesn't like us to have to to have our own ethical system and and to decide together with using our morality and and politics is what we do in everyday life to secure all the necessities of our survival you know like so so that we can be you know relaxed and and and, and that's what Paul Rosenberg sp spoke about in his talk. And, you know, that, that is the, the thing that create value and, and the state extract that value. It's a parasite on top of the society. 
You know, we can call that the democratic nation. It's like a nation that exists like everywhere. And it's amongst us and that's who we're serving and that's the free society. Now, for the, uh, for the dystopia and like what's at stake, we already talked about these uh, uh, drones, these death machines. I forgot one detail though, which is that the US has invented a new type of missile. A missile doesn't explode upon impact. It shoots ninja swords. It's a precise weapon. There's a, there's a picture of a car that I saw where above the driver's roof, there was a small hole and there was bits of body parts all around the car and it didn't explode, just eliminated a single person. You have highly precise drones that can have complete coverage of the sky. They're cheap to manufacture. They last for hours and hours observing one piece of ground and you have a drone that can eliminate any single individual human being, you know at will, that's uh, deadly power. You know, the, when we brought China into the WEF in the 90s, we said, oh, China, they will get more democratic, they'll be more nice and stuff. But actually it didn't happen, China just did China things. And instead what has happened is that the, the, the Westerners, the, Euro the Europeans, the people in the EU central bank and stuff like that, they, have looked at China and they're like, huh, that's a pretty good idea. We should do that shit. And that's what CBDCs are about, CBDCs. And, and, and the worst part is, is uh, people talk about UBI and like, oh yeah, it's great. I will get paid for doing nothing all day. I'll get paid free money. They give me free stuff. And it's like, that's like literally a shit coin airdrop to incentivize people to move into their social credit system, like which China has, if you don't know social credit scoring, if you are late for a meeting or you talk with someone bad, you get a lower social credit score. If your neighbor says you're doing something bad, if you do good behaviors, they give you a higher social credit score. If your social credit score is too low, you can't get a train ticket. Your rent is more expensive. If you have a high social credit, you get more privileges. So um, if you really want to see this, though, like you don't want to just understand the logic of what I'm saying. You actually want to see what it would look like. I, you, should, you should look at the movie Blame, which is from 2015. It's an uh, anime. I think it's, it's probably the best movie. Uh, and it's so, it's, I, I find it really kind of terrifying because of how realistic it is, where it's in the future and uh, human beings used to be able to control these giant machines called the builders that would build the city. And the city is now a vast, vast megastructure that's like, you know, like absolutely huge. Like it takes literally centuries for, for people to walk just across one room. And, is, and hum humans lost uh, a gene that they have that they would be able to use to connect to the 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 net sphere, which is like the internet, where they can where they can give orders to the authority, which controlled the builders, controlled the machines. But then the safeguard, which is security system, preemptively has declared human beings illegal residents of the city, and it hunts human beings to extinction. And it's like the when the the way that they depict this giant megastructure which is beyond human comprehension, that humans exist in on the edge, living on the edge, um, hunted by, by uh, machines to extinction. There's a very good movie, the Blame movie. That's kind of what I imagine the current, uh, the way things will go if, it's, if, the, if the state civilization is not put in check because it's getting out of control. Thanks a lot. Uh, Question. Maybe we will have time for one or two questions. Raise your hand. Okay, I can see it here. Uh, thank you for a very good speech. Uh, you were looking for uh, someone from Solar Punk, but you actually uh, need to look somewhere else, not for uh, Solar Punk people, but for normies, pe normies people. Uh, and my question is, if you if you imagine normies. Uh, or ordinary people, 
and uh, they give uh, uh, voting possibilities to, uh, to vote for government, solar punk, which is in some way government to zero, and lunar punk. What uh, will uh, uh, ordinary people vote for? And I, uh, I of, uh, think that they will vote for solar punk because they are inventing them for beach, not for uh, some way to dark forest. They know uh, so state is shit. And uh, solar punk is uh, promising nice beach. And we are in inviting them to dark forest. Thanks. Again, uh, I think that uh, uh, most people will not do this choice of being a lunar punk or solar punk or um, fully committing to some vision. Um, I think in life people uh, experience uh, that they have many needs, they need to solve many problems. So as I said, for example, if your financial transaction is stopped all the time uh, by banks, uh, you start using crypto because you need it, uh, but it doesn't mean you immediately cancel your health insurance. So you, you go dark in one area of life and you, um, uh, you use the mainstream society or the solar punk vision for another. And I think this will probably be the experience uh, of most people that, that they, will, um, they will pick uh, pieces out of uh, each of these uh, uh, actually market providers of some kinds of services. So there will of course be people who commit to the vision and uh, they, uh, they would like to try out to let's say opt out of the mainstream society and opt in uh, to this uh, different vision. I have met uh, many people like this here who uh, actually in many areas of their life they, they, they go dark and they go, uh, they opt out. Uh, if you know the Wi-Fi password of this place uh, is uh, Vejivan, maybe you have noticed it, uh, which means uh, uh, enter outside, go outside. So um, when you enter this place, you enter the outside of the mainstream society. And uh, for many of us, this will be the experience. But I think most people will not ever have to make this choice like for their whole identity. They will just pick bits and pieces uh, that work for them. Uh, thanks a lot. Unfortunately, we are out of our time because in three minutes another presentation is uh, starting. So thanks a lot for uh, coming here. <laughs> and I would like to say a big thanks to our speakers. Okay, they will be here. <laughs>